Good day. My name is Mrs. Pinar. I am presenting an exam-based uh, presentation for NM21, DJP and DPP. Your table of contents. The development of pre-primary numeracy. The development of learners' understanding of numbers, their symbols and their values. How to develop learners' ability to identify features of objects and then classify them. Also, how to develop learners' observation of patterns, sequence and ordinal numbers. How to develop an understanding of spatial awareness. Then the four basic operations in mathematics and problem solving. Also the measurement of time, length, mass and capacity. Two and three dimensional shapes and data analysis. And then lastly, the teaching and learning activities and materials for pre-primary numeracy and mathematics. We will start off with the development of pre-primary numeracy. Here we will tackle sequencing and ordering. Now what are sequencing and ordering? It's simply putting events, ideas or objects in a logical order. Informal activities to practice sequencing. How can we practice sequencing in our classrooms. The first example is picture sequencing. We can have uh, pictures of different um, stages. For instance, the stages of a frog. The learners then look at the egg, uh, the, uh, then the development of the egg until the the frog is fully developed. So the learner decide which one comes first. Different pictures of even an egg, a chicken, and then a grown, uh, uh, a chick, and then a grown up, a chicken. So the learners decide which one comes first. This is how we can practice picture sequencing in our classrooms. Photo sequencing, uh, for example, learners can bring photos of themselves from when they were babies until uh, the age that they are now, six or seven years old, four or five pictures from home, and then the learner now put this into sequence when the learner was a baby until the one learner uh, start coming to school. That is how we practice uh, these uh, activities. Letter and number sequencing is another form of how we can develop numeracy in pre-primary class and then sequencing in daily life. Uh, for instance, the child uh, tells us what he does when he gets up in the morning until he comes to school or until he leaves school. Brush teeth, come to school in the morning, uh, learn things at school and go home, what they do in the afternoon, uh, sequencing in daily life. These are the activities that the learner can do and this is all to, development, to, the, to the development of numeracy in the pre-primary class. This is an example of sequencing. The child see that there's a bottle of uh, jam on the table, the bread, then he uh, put the jam on the bread, then he put the two slices of bread together, and then he starts eating. This is just simple examples of how the child can practice sequencing. Uh, classifying and sorting. When learners group things together, they use firstly color, size, shape or kind. Now in our classrooms, because it's pre-primary and junior primary, we should always have different colors. I have an example of how they can use colors. So as a teacher, I give the learners a group of colors and then I ask them to sort these colors so they will know that these colors, sometimes they won't know the color, but because they can look at the colors, they will be able 
to sort and this is just kind of sorting that we can do with our learners grouping colors grouping shapes those are flat shapes here i have other shapes that the learners can use these are still some more shapes so i should always have practical things in my class to help these learners with these activities and they will now be able to see these shapes go together and these colors goes together this is how i practice do practice examples of what my child can do in the class regarding classifying and sorting uh, grouping blocks like these blocks that we have here grouping blocks in colors and shape and sizes i also can have pictures of house ice household items like fruit, vegetables, and I ask my child to classify which ones are fruit and which ones are vegetables, or practical things that I can do in my class. I can also ask the child to bring some pictures of things that he likes and dislikes, all, all have to do with sorting and classifying. Or if the child goes to the shop, ask the child to come back tomorrow to tell the teacher which ones of those items that he uh, saw in the shop are meat products, which ones are frozen, which ones are sweet, all these things so that the child can acknowledge that uh, things on earth has to be classified and sought. Uh, these are examples of uh, worksheets that I can give to my child. Um, yeah, the child see that all these items except two of them has to do with clothing. So the child just encircle the items that does not have to do with clothing. And this is how I practice sorting and classifying. Same this side, I have different animals and the child can just group the different animals. Here we have horses, here we have some dogs, some cows and some cats. So the child can just encircle. So here the child is grouping uh, the objects that he can see. Right, what are the concepts of color, shape, and size? The basic steps to introduce color. First of all, in my pre primary class, I should introduce one color or one shape at a time. These are small learners, so I should remember only one color or one shape at a time. And we use these kind of objects that I have here to introduce my color. If I introduce red today, all the objects that I will be using today will be of a red color. After that, I use my color sh or shape poster. So now, from the real object, the, color, the child goes to the poster and now the child identify the color on the poster or the shape on the poster. Usually I start with the colors that's in my classroom, things that the child can see. So I will also ask the child, please go identify the red color, that all the red color things that you can observe in the classroom. I do all these things practically. Then I can use cutouts and allow learners to select a certain color. So I cut out a lot of different colors and I ask the learner, to identify, to bring all the red colors to the teacher or put the red colors aside. Allow the learners to seek hidden colors so I can also hide some colors in the classroom and ask the learners to go find those colors. The worksheets, I, I can also make use of worksheets where I give different colors and then the learner needs to draw a circle around the specific color. And then learners can discover different shades of color. So red have different shades, darker red or lighter red. And then let the learners make a color book. Those are all the activities that learners can do regarding shape, color or size. The primary colors. What are primary colors? Primary colors are colors that I do not mix with other colors to create a color. For instance, Red is a primary color, blue is a primary color, and yellow is a primary color. 
but if I mix those colors, I get other colors. Uh, for example, orange. Orange is not a primary color. To get orange, I have to mix red and yellow. So my three primary colors are red, blue, and yellow. Right. When it comes to the measurement of length, mass, capacity, and time, we have to remember these are small learners. When we talk about these measurements, we do not use the units of measurements. Like for instance, for length, I do not uh, measure uh, in centimeters or in meters. Same with mass, capacity, and time. Time is not like in hours or in seconds. So how then do I go about uh, learn, uh, teaching these learners about length, mass, capacity, and time in my pre-primary class. And all these things should be very practical. I must always, always make use of practical examples to teach these um, concepts. Let's go to length. <clears throat> How to teach length? Learners start by using non-standard objects to measure with. They can use their feet, they can use their hands. Uh, there's an example, using their feet, the heel to toe. I put my heel against my toe and I now count how many times, my, how many feet I will use to measure the length of my classroom or the length of my desk or whatever example I give to my child. And uh, the, even the hand span. I can ask the learner to measure with my hand span. I can ask the learner to count how many hand spans I will, it will take for the length of his friend. So when it comes to length, learners just use the concept of long and short in my pre-primary class. And these are the examples that they can make use of uh, when it comes to length. Those are some worksheets that I have given you examples of. When it comes to mass, mass, the only uh, uh, concept that they use here is either it's light or it's heavy when it comes to mass. And for mass, we have to use hefting in this case for pre-primary or uh, primary learners. Hefting meaning I have a... a, a heavier object in my one hand and a lighter object in my other hand. So the learner now has to compare using his hands which one is heavier and which one is lighter. So this is what is called hefting. So in my class, I use practical examples of heavy objects and light objects by hefting. Other examples are pushing and pulling. He can push his chair or you can try to push the teacher's table. And regarding how hard he has to push, the learner will know now which one is lighter and which one is more heavy. So these are the activities that I do in my class. Practical activities that I can do with my learners. When it comes to the concept of time, I already said, I do not talk about minutes and, and hours and seconds. Now, how do I teach the concept of time to my pre-primary learners? First of all, I talk about long and short periods of time. The time of the day, I talk about morning, afternoon, and night. And I will ask my learners to bring uh, pictures of what they do in the morning, what they do in the afternoons and what they, they do in the evenings. So the, that is the concept of time that they should have. Uh, when we talk about time of the day, it's just morning, afternoon or night. When it comes to the days of the week, uh, I will ask my learners to bring some pictures of days of the week when they come to school. Uh, then they know it's uh, Mondays to Fridays, they come to school. Uh, and then Saturdays, I can ask them to bring some pictures of what they do on Saturdays, so maybe soccer or whatever they do on Saturdays. And on Sundays, they go to church. 
So these are the concepts of days of the week that you should have. The days that they come to school and what they do on weekends. Months of the year. Uh, in primary, we expect them just to know the months of the year. So in my class, for that month, I will have a calendar of the days of a specific month. And I might have when learners' birthdays are that specific month. So the learners can see how long a day takes, how long a week takes, because now they are anticipating it's my birthday in two days, in, in one day, tomorrow is my birthday. So this is how they grasp the, the concept of time at this age. Other activities to help learners grasp the concept of time is the creating of calendars, like the one in the picture there. Use timely words, words like, Today, tomorrow, uh, yesterday, those are the timely words. That they, what you did tomorrow, what you're gonna, uh, what you did yesterday, what you're gonna do tomorrow, those are the words that I should constantly use to make them aware of the concept of time. There are also books that I can read about time and then make a countdown, a countdown chain. Like there are 10 days left before the holidays, so each day <clears throat> I get rid of uh, one of the chain and then as the chain becomes shorter, the less days there will be for them towards the holiday. Right, how to develop the learner's understanding of numbers, their symbols and values. Now there are two kinds of counting, road counting and rational counting. Now root counting is what is developed first. By the age of three years old, most of the learners or most of our children knows to count from one to ten. So they can count, it's just a reciting of numbers, but they do not have the concept yet of how many uh, objects ten are. It's so the first uh, counting that we develop is road counting, and that is just the reciting of numbers. Rational counting is what develops next. And this is a higher level of one-to-one -one correspondence. One-to-one -one correspondence just means the child can now put a number of objects to the number. So if I see two sweets there, the learner knows one, two. There are two sweets or five or whatever, it's one-to-one -one correspondence. It's a higher level of counting. Now, what are the advantages of counting? The advantages of counting is simple, as simply when it comes to local, uh, national level, let's talk, start with less national level. For instance, we all know that we have one of other time in, in our country, we have census. And why do we have census? We need to find out how many people there are in the country. Why do the government need to know how many people there are? Because they need to, row, to, to build clinics, schools, roads to sustain all these people. So the advantages on national level is to make provision of services, that is what why the should, census should be done. What is the advantages of counting on local level? Measuring and calculating human traffic and motor vehicle by municipalities to build roads. And on personal level, communication. How do I communicate? I need to tell people how old I am. I need to tell, be able to tell people how many siblings I have, I need to be able to communicate my phone number, everything has to do with numbers. And to solve problems in reasoning, I need to know if I have enough money to go to the shop, if I want to buy bread, I need to know what the amount uh, is, the price of the bread is, and do I have enough money and what my change will be. All these things have to do with counting. All right. That is just a picture of one-to-one -one correspondence. The child needs to count and the child knows that is now five objects. How do I teach my child or my learner 
number names and symbols. I start with what the learner already know. Now, what, is, what does the learner already know? They know how to count one, two, five, but they might not know the symbol and how to write the name. So I will have one object. I show the child the one object. Then I will uh, write the symbol. I will write the symbol, which is now the one for the child on the board. And then I will also write the word for the child, one. So the child already knows the word one. Now he sees one object. Uh, he sees the symbol for one and he sees the number name. And that is how I introduce all my number names and symbols to my learners. Right, what are the different styles for learning? First of all, why do I need to teach different styles of learning? I sit with many learners in my class and each of them are individuals, so they learn on diff uh, diff with different styles. Some of my learners learn more visually. So the first learning style that we are doing is a visual learning style. If I hear visual, things that they see. So my learner le learn better by seeing things. They need to see. They need to see the posters that I have. They need to see objects. So this kind of learner is a learner that will learn better by what he sees. So yeah, how I, will I identify these learners? Learners will prefer images, pictures, or maps. Now they can visualize, because I have shown them some objects, now they can visualize these objects. So when, when I talk about five, or if I talk about red, he will visualize because he has seen it, uh, because I've showed it to him. They have good uh, spatial sense. These learners love drawing, and overall they have a good sense of the dress and color balance. These are the learners that learn better through what they see, visual. Another learning style is auditory. Auditory has to do with what they hear. So these kind of learners learn better what, with what they hear. So here I will try and tell more stories. When I introduce something, I will uh, tell a story to the learners because they want to hear uh, more. They learn by hearing, auditory learners. Learners uh, will learn on hearing and speaking and they should be able to hear to learn effective. So if a learner learns better by hearing, uh, I would rather put the learner more to the front of the class because this learner needs to hear every word I say. And then there are learners that learn more by touching, better by touching. These learners will learn more by exp experimenting. So if they have to feel things, the texture of things, I will send them out to go find some soil to feel the texture of soil. They want to feel, they want to feel the objects, they want to feel uh, the shapes of objects for them to learn. Um, here I have some shapes. So I will give my shapes to the learner because this learner wants to feel, not just to see that this is a, a triangle. He also wants to feel what the triangle feels like or a circle. This is how these kind of learners learn better. So I have to identify my learners and I have to cater for all my learners in my class. Right, what is visual discrimination? Visual discrimination is the ability to see the difference and all the similarities between objects, meaning I need to see that these objects, both of these kind of objects, they are, they are green in color, but I also have to see the differences the similarities, they are green, and the differences between objects. This is what we mean with the uh, visual discrimination. The ability to see the difference and or similarities 
between objects around us, enabling us to understand and interpret the world around us better. What are the roles of this uh, visual discrimination? Learners must be able to distinguish between different letters in or to read and write words. And learners must be able to distinguish between different number symbols and names. That is why visual discrimination is important. Right. What are the attributes of visual discrimination? The attributes are color, shape, direction, size, and distance. Now, what do they have to discriminate when it comes to color? The ability to discriminate the primary colors. We spoke about the primary colors earlier on. Red, yellow, and blue. When it comes to shapes, the basic shapes of triangle, circle, and square are important. When it comes to direction, the ability to discriminate between up and down, over and under, etc. Um, size and quality. Some of these concepts are big or little, fat or thin, long or short more or less and so on and distance uh, it has to do with the spatial relations and uh, an ability to analyze the distance between lines and space the learners must be able to distinguish between near and far i'm near to the ta teacher's table he is far from the teacher's table these are the attributes of visual discrimination Now, if learners have difficulty with visual discrimination, how do I identify these learners? Learners may not be able to dress themselves. They will not be able to distinguish between the similarities and differences in formation of letters. And they will not be able to distinguish between the size of letters or objects. If you look at the picture here, there are some similarities, there are some differences, and the learner needs to identify where the differences are. We can give some of these. There are many that we can get in magazines uh, to practice this with our learners, to find the differences in different uh, uh, pictures that almost look the same, but there are a few differences. So those are the activities that I can give to my learners to practice the visual discrimination. Now, what is form, co uh, form constancy? It is the ability that allows you to understand that a shape or object stays the same even if you view it from a different direction or in a different environment or with a different size. Um, Simple example, example there is the, uh, the circle in my classroom that I have shown the learner. I, t I ask the learner to go home or even in the classroom, can you identify any, of the, any other object in the classroom that, is, that has a circle shape? And the learners need to identify maybe a clock in the classroom or a clock at home, maybe his plate at home. Any other round object or circular form object the, ne the learner needs to identify to know that the circle in the class is the same shape than the circle at home. So this is form constancy, the ability that allows you to understand that a shape stays the same even if it's not in the environment that I have shown the child. Now what activities do, can I use to help? To develop form constancy, I can cut out shapes and group them so that the learner can arrange them from small to big. I can ask the learner to point out objects in class that looks the same like a certain shape, like the circle I spoke about just now. And I can make use of worksheets with different objects 
with the same shape and ask the learner to identify the specific shape. Yeah, is uh, is an example of a worksheet. So the learner needs to identify which of these what he sees on this side can I identify and, and uh, draw a circle around the one that is uh, exactly the same as the one on my left side? Some worksheets. Right. <clears throat> what are ordinal numbers? Ordinal numbers are numbers that shows or tells position. So here yeah, I can have uh, maybe some animals five animals in a row and I will ask the learner for instance say I have a dog and a cat and a donkey and I will ask the learner tell me the position of the donkey in this picture and the ordinal number here is then third of the position or the position of the dog in the picture and the learner needs to tell me the dog is first so ordinal numbers tells the position of an object in a group of objects. Right. What is spatial awareness? Spatial awareness is the ability to understand and interact with the environment around you. What do we mean? Uh, I need to know the distance between my chair and my desk so that I don't bump into my desk every time or the distance between my desk and the teacher's desk that is a uh, spatial awareness I need to be aware of how far or how near I'm, I am to certain things or objects now what are the characteristics of learners with poor spatial awareness meaning learners that uh, the spatial awareness is not that well developed. How do I aden identify these learners? What are the characteristics? They are the learners that usually appear clumsy. They bump into everything around them. They bump into the table. They even sometimes fall over their own feet. They are clumsy. Other characteristics are they are unable to tell left from right. They have difficult doing physical activities to jump or to run. Uh, they have problems copying patterns and shape. And they are also unable to interpret instructions. When the teacher say the book is under your desk, the book is on top of your desk, uh, then they get confused because they have a problem with spatial awareness. Right, here are some uh, vocabulary that I can use to help my learner with the concepts of spatial awareness. I can play games, like on this picture, I can ask my learner to go low, I can ask my learner to go high, to go close, to go far, to open the arms. Those are all games or oral directions that I can give my child. I can place toys in position. I ask the, the learner to put the toy on top of the table, under the table, uh, far from the learner, near to the learner. Those are all vocabulary that I can use to help my learner with spatial awareness. So play games, give oral direction, place toys in position, <clears throat> build and learn, use blocks, use blocks so that they can use to build blocks. I ask the child to, to create something for me um, with blocks, classroom labels, far, near, up, down. Those are the kind of labels that I should have in the classroom. Partner play, where they play with each other, like they go tight together, they go far from each other, they go close, over and under dance, where they go um, under the table, over the chair, and things like that, songs, 
and then obstacle causes of all uh, things that I can do to expand those learners uh, vocabulary right Piaget's four stages of co cognitive development now Piaget is a psychologist of many years ago and he did work of great importance for education and his theory is that there are four stages in a human's life that has to do with its, uh, the human's co cognitive development. And he's grouped it, the sensory motor stage between the ages of two, uh, zero and two years. And this is what the learner or the child can do at that stage pre-operational stage between the ages of two and seven and this is what the child is able to do at that stage of his life the concrete operational stage between the ages of two seven and eleven years and then the last stage in a person's life in a human's life formal operational from eleven onwards and this is what he found uh, the cognitive development in a human's development is. So, there you have it. Piaget's cognitive development stages, the four stages, and the description. All right. And the four basic operations in mathematics and problem solving. Whenever they do addition sub or subtraction, they need to know the place value of a number. So if I have one or uh, 243 or 228, uh, the one is a unit which should be there actually. And then the four is four tens and two tens for 28 and I have two hundreds for 243 so uh, and the child needs to know the hundreds the tens and the units and this is just another example of the four basic operations right reading and writing numbers in words and in numerals we can give you the number and then you have to be able to write it in a numeral or we can give it to you in a numeral ach, in, a, in a word and you should be able to write it in a numeral so numerals and words be able to write the, the number in numerals and in words data handling data handling you will either have a tele chart a bar chart or a pictogram and all information is given on a chart if it's a pictogram we will usually find a key and in this case it tells us that one cupcake is equal to six cupcakes one picture of a cupcake is equal to six cupcakes so all we need to know is <clears throat> when we are asked to find the sum of something, we add. When we are asked the difference, we need to subtract. So in this case, if I ask you what, how many cupcakes were sold on Monday? So here I have one, two, three, four, five. So if one picture represents six cupcakes, it will be five times six so on Monday <coughs> sorry, the total of cupcakes sold on Monday will then be 30 I add them now what is the difference between the number of cupcakes sold on Monday and Wednesday Wednesday I have one two three four times six is 24 so 30 minus 24 gives me six so the difference I subtract. The total I add and the difference I subtract. 
when it comes to <clears throat> two-dimensional and three-dimensional shapes. These are all two-dimensional shapes, and usually we call them, they are flat shapes. The three-dimensional shapes are the shapes that have volume. So if I go back to my two-dimensional shapes, the circle, the oval, I should be able to identify them according to their proper properties. How will I recognize a square? Because it has four equal sides. The rectangle, two of the opposite sides are equal. A triangle has three sides. And so I need to know the properties so that I can identify them. The three-dimensional shapes are shapes that have length, um, breadth, as well as height. So a three-dimensional shapes have three dimensions because it also have volume. And these are my three-dimensional shapes, and I should also know their properties. Right. When it comes to a lesson plan, as a teacher, I should be able to know how to draw up a lesson plan because this is what I will do for my life. Now, I have an example of a lesson plan. Yeah, my theme is transport. My topic can be data handling because the data that I will be collecting will be all be about transport. So my theme will be transport and my topic is data handling. Now, remember the lesson objective. The lesson objective and the lesson competencies are what I will get from my syllabus. And my lesson objective will always be at the end of the lesson because I, there's something that I want to achieve at, at the end of every lesson. So what do I want to achieve as, as a teacher in that specific lesson? So lesson objective will always be at the end of the lesson. And in this case, all the learners must be able to draw a picture or pictograph using pictures that they cut out and paste at the end of the lesson. What do I want my learners to be able to do? So it must be a doing word, a verb. They must be able to draw. They must be able to do something at the end of my lesson. What is, what, uh, is my basic competency? What do I want my learners to be able to do? And I start with learners should be able to understand the concept of drawing a pictograph in this case. My direct instruction, what me as a teacher, what will I do? What instruction will I give? So in this case, I will show them a graph and then I will discuss the graph. I will ask them like I did just now previously when we did, sorry, I just want to go back. When we did the graph, yeah, I ask you some questions on this graph. So this is my direct instruction to you as a teacher. So you show the graph to the learner and you discuss the graph. The guided practice. What do I want my learners to do now? I want them to group, to make groups of four. I give each one a set of pictures of cars, buses, taxis, bicycles, or children walking. The learners cut out the pictures and, and then each one gets about five to ten to cut out and then they sort the pictures into groups so from the pictures that I give the learners they will now sort them into cars buses bicycles or children walking they will do something now practical guided practice when it comes to the closure of my lesson yeah I will repeat the important facts of the lesson what do I want them to know I want them to be able to, to group things and to draw a pictograph. So I repeat the important facts of the lesson. What do I write when it comes to material? 
Yeah, everything the teacher will use during the lesson. The worksheets, the pictures, if they are real objects, sometimes I use, uh, when it comes to measurement, I use real objects like water or glass, uh, glass and with, uh, or different containers. Everything that I use in my class, I write as material. When it comes to assessment, here, yeah, check whether they have sorted and pasted correctly. So I will give them a worksheet and then as a teacher I will go around and check whether and then guide the learners, those ones that I've seen that do not, uh, are not, do not understand what I've asked them to do, that I help them. So when it comes to assessment, I will check whether they have sorted or pasted correctly. This is what my lesson plan should look like. Right. Calculating time. I have two examples here. Calculating time. Uh, in my example, I have four hours, 25 minutes, plus one hour, 55 minutes. Now, first of all, I will group my hours. And then I will group my minutes. What do I have? Four hours plus one hour is equal to five hours. Twenty-five plus fifty-five is equal to uh, 80 minutes right what do I see here that 80 minutes is more than one hour so I subtract my 60 minutes for the hour I am left with 20 minutes this is one hour so I add it as an hour so my answer now is six hours 20 minutes. I group my hours, I group my minutes. If I see that my minutes are more than an hour, because I know there are 60 minutes in an hour, my 60 minutes become one more hour, and I'm left with 6 hours and 20 minutes. My next example. I have 5 days and 10 hours and I must subtract 3 days and 20 hours how do I go about? I group 5 days minus 3 days and I have 10 hours minus 20 hours right Five days minus three days gives me two days. What do I find there? Ten minus twenty. What do I do? Usually I go borrow. So I have to go borrow from my days, which will leave me with one day. So in one day I have 24 hours. So it's 10 hours plus 24 hours. I work together. I borrowed one day there, which is equal to 24 hours. So now I will have 34 hours minus my 20 hours. So I'm left with one day and 14 hours. Calculating time. I group. 
my hours and or and my minutes or my days and my hours all right in conclusion just want to wish you luck remember be mindful of the time as you are writing the examination spend at least two minutes per mark don't waste time with questions yet you do not know go to the ones that you are comfortable with and then return to the difficult ones later prepare well in advance for the examination and don't wait till the last minute to study if you are not ready, you will become nervous during the, during the examination and this could lead to failure. Write as neatly as you can.